Hi all, I'm Jess Gleason. I'm from NAB and um, as, uh, as Adam said, AI, AI readiness is a big topic for us today and you know, at NAB there's a lot of excitement around Gen AI, a lot of uh, use cases, a lot of opportunities where we see big sets of unstructured data and it's hard, it's hard work. And we're all just about how do we use this technology to make things look easy. And I, I'd say there's some cyclists in this room and I'm sure some of you have been riding up a hill and someone just swoons past you on an electric bike. And after the expletives, you're like, wow, that looks easy. So how do we make that happen in AI? But I think that dream is great, but the, re the readiness reality is, is the thing that we're here to talk to you about today. And we've got the trifecta panel. We've got clients, so myself and Tracy, and we've got the technology, Warren from AWS, and our, our, our professional services partners in Accenture. So with that, I'm going to hand over to each of them to talk about, you know, what are you seeing where you're coming from? And uh, what are the interesting AI use cases? So starting with uh, Fegan. Thank you. And thanks for, for the invitation to speak to you about Gen AI here. Um, I think it was approximately 12 months ago that our CEO, Julie Sweet, has announced that we will do a major investment in Gen AI, three billion. It's a huge number over three years of time. Um, how we are investing it to get Gen AI ready is actually in three areas. The first area into people. What we're doing is we are doubling our talent to 80,000 data and AI professionals. We will do that with, and we are doing that with upskilling, we are hiring in this area, but also through acquisitions. The second area of investment is building an AI navigator platform. Just think about it is as a platform which will help our clients to choose the right architecture to get Gen AI ready, to analyze the data, to understand what, I, what could be your Gen AI journey look like, and also to look at the use cases. And the third area is um, investing into LLM models. So when we look at that, how we are getting overall ready is from a technology point of view to embed, transform, innovate. So we can make sure in our day-to-day -day life, we embed the technology which is available to us. For example, in calls that the meeting minutes have been taken, in emails for grammar or spell checking, which is pretty useful when you're not, uh, when, you're, when English is not your uh, first language, but also to transform your operating model and um, to help with innovation of uh, new products and differenti differentiate those. Great. Hi, my role at Telstra is the Data and AI COE, Center of Excellence, and that kind of means everything and nothing. So I might talk a little about why the role exists and how Telstra's using this team to accelerate our AI adventures. So we look at emerging technologies from three perspectives. So can the technology solve this real problem? Is it feasible? Then we look at, is it safe and responsible? Should we be using this technology to solve this problem? What would our customers and stakeholders think? And finally, we look at the commercial viability. So what would it take to scale this? And what does that mean in terms of um, skills and in terms of safe scalability? What does the total cost of ownership look like? Telstra as an organization have set some pretty wild ambitions in terms of AI. So we're, half, we're two thirds of the way through our three year T25 strategy. And as part of that, we've been talking to the market about our ambitions to have 100% of key business processes AI enabled, 100%. It's a big ask. Two years in, we are just ahead of target. So we're very excited, but not complacent. The kind of places where we're really focusing our AI energies and really seeing the best results so far are twofold. One is in the sort of customer facing, customer service departments and where we actually help customers solve problems. And the second is what might for some organizations be the back office, but for Telstra it's our network. So networks nowadays are incredibly software powered and AI is helping us spot problems before they impact our customers and resolve them before anyone notices. So that's pretty exciting. 
Cool. Um, so, hi, I'm Warren. <laughs> um, I work for Amazon Web Services. For those of you who don't know, it's the cloud computing business that's part of the Amazon group. Um, Amazon's been using machine learning and AI for almost 18 years now. Um, so predominantly in the sort of supply chain space, customer experience as well. So there's a lot of um, sophisticated processes in that, that part of the business. Um, middle of last year, um, we started to open up um, the AI services for the broader business to actually access. And what we've seen is, um, as a company that's sort of a group of builders, we like to call ourselves builders, so everyone's hands-on, likes to experiment, likes to get their hands dirty. Um, we started to see pockets of the business um, use this technology for their own businesses to grow and evolve them. So HR functions, legal, sales, the engineering team specifically. Um, but everyone started to sort of use this technology and go, how can they make their business better? We're very metricated as well, so we've got a huge focus on frugality in terms of what we spend our money on, how do we do that? The biggest focus is customer outcomes. So how do we make sure that what we're doing here is beneficial for our end customers? So, so moving on to the more important part of what we're doing is getting those great customer stories out there. So I think for us, um, it's helping those businesses like the Telstra's and the NABs and working with partners like Accenture to go, how do they evolve the business? So um, again, no offense to anyone in this room here. Um, what we're seeing is the fastest adopters of the technology that are doing things really exciting are the digital natives, the startups, the software providers who are building these brand new companies in some cases, um, using the platform and just literally creating new verticals. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, I guess from a more sort of regulated entity, we're seeing customers use the technology to do a hell of a lot. So we'll talk about that probably later on, but um, that's the 30 second interlude. Excellent. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of people around this uh, room, 12 months ago, Gen AI just started to become a really hot topic. I know our executive team went overseas. A lot of people in this room would have had the same experience and there, there was a amount of excitement on the ground when we came back. Um, certainly programs were stood up, excitement about what this capability could enable, but like everything, particularly people like me who've worked in technology for a long time, there is a point where the ship of dreams hits the rocks of reality. And I'm keen to understand from the panel, a year on from that, and also after a lot of the executives have been overseas, what are you seeing you know, from what was promised to what we're actually being able to put into place on the ground? And maybe from a, Fing, I'll start with you from an Accenture point of view yeah, sure. and what you're seeing with a lot of your clients. Of course, yeah. And, um um, I'm actually really excited to talk about that because I have visibility not just about uh, what's happening in Australia, also our global clients. Let me give you probably four use cases which are, which are very interesting from a banking point of view. So the first one we are seeing is, um, is Gen AI um, in um, back office and middle office for call center. So the capability to implement it into into, uh, into call center for transcript to help um, to transcript um, call center conversations. That's a use case which, is, uh, which we are seeing globally but also in Australia which has been implemented and is probably one of the top ones. The second one which we are currently working on with also a, a global client is a transaction monitoring. We heard about scams, we heard around uh, um, how we are trying to protect our clients and that's where the technology really helps uh, to support with, um, with the um, tools in place to reduce the um, FTEs needed to understand are these transactions actually fraudulent or not, or is it a scam on it? So this um, leads to a benefit of 30% um, of FTE reductions where you can then go in and invest that into, um, into preventing those scams. The third area is um, a um, US use case for mortgage origination, which is very interesting. Um, I think a couple of years ago we were talking around, or even today we were talking about housing affordability, right? What our banks are going to do to be able to offer more um, uh, mortgages so people can buy, especially um, the um, younger generation can buy a uh, um, and afford uh, a, a house. And uh, what we are doing with our US bank, which is already uh, implemented is, um, the, in the US the regulator, state and federal, has quite a lot of support for repayments. So if you would just go in and put it into your calculator, someone's salary, you may get a decline with 
old legacy platforms. But what we are using with the Gen AI tool is, and what we can offer, um, is that the system just understands which repayment opportunities this client would get from a federal, from a state level, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty complex over there. And then they get actually uh, approval and can buy the property and be a homeowner. So it actually helps the customer and also the, um, the um, provider. And then last but not least, um, in the SDLC process from a technology point of view, I think if you've ever worked in tech and have written business requirements of done testing, a uh, great use case where we are using um, Gen AI tools also for our programmers. So um, they can, uh, they, they, they get buddied up with a Gen AI companion and it really helps and improves productivity by minimum 20%. And then just just to sort of a, a, a double click on some of those answers, when we look at the Australian context, mm. is there anything you're seeing from your overseas experience that's particularly relevant to us or you know, people within this room? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think all those four examples are, are, uh, are very um, interesting. The STLC one, the origination one. Sure, we don't have those regulations, but you can still look at increasing, um, increasing approval rates in, uh, for home lendings, but also de-risking um, uh, repayments. And that's, that's something we are talking to, to our banking clients and they're really interested in. Amazing. Tracy, from a Telstra point of view, what's your year looked like? Yeah, um, I look back on the launch of ChatGPT in the world with um, a blend of, I was going to say love and hate, which sounds dramatic, but, you know, it will be dramatic. Um, I think it gave the impression to lots of people that we had invented some kind of all-knowing oracle that has the answers to everything. There's a magic box. We've all been using Google for 20 years. That's a magic box. You type things in and things come back. So I think a lot of people first interacted with ChatGPT and thought, excellent, like Google, better, accurate, faster, all-knowing Oracle. And all of us who have tried to use the models behind to build real business applications in the last year have learned the hard way, the easy way with our partners, that there's a lot more to it than an all-knowing oracle. So the stories that I want to share about things we're really proud of, I'm extra proud of because we've been on the learning journey at the same time, you know, the sort of trough of disillusionment and learned all our great lessons along the way. So there are two um, flagship generative AI projects that are in the hands of thousands of Telstra staff today and they're showing real benefits in terms of um, reduced customer average handling times and first call resolution. So just like Fagan mentioned, we have started with um, agent-facing customer service tools. So one's called Ask Telstra, and it helps these agents look through their thousands of articles in the knowledge base and get much more um, accurate, up-to-date answers more quickly. And the second one, same context, sort of helping our agents help customers more quickly, more accurately. And that one is one sentence summary, where we use generative AI techniques to summarize the last couple of weeks of interactions. So if you call or you go into a store, then the person you're talking to has that beautiful short summary of your interactions, your service quality, your payments, all of those things that as customers and as humans, we might expect people to know. And I think um, because I'm privileged enough to be invited along to join the banking conference today, I want to shout out to Commonwealth Bank in the first instance and everybody else as well for partnering with building the scam indicator tool. So for joint customers, we have prevented millions of dollars worth of scams from happening. Um, really proud of that, and I think we all know that scams aren't just measured in dollars lost, they're measured in all sorts of heartache. So, feeling really proud about having that one out in the world. You're amazing. And Warren, obviously there's a lot of chat GPT chat around the, the, the campfire, but from an AWS perspective, you're looking at you know, different technologies and alternative technologies. What's the last year looked like from that, that side of the fence? So I think building what everyone's been saying, like in the, the headline from all the consultants is, you know, last year was the year of experimentation, this year is the year of value. 
Um, we're starting to see there's a lot of money spent last year on other technologies. Um, and the question now is, you know, what's the ROI on this? So if you're going to continue to invest in this technology, what's the real business value? What's the customer sort of benefit you're going to get from that? So, so I think I'll talk to two examples, that um, uh, international examples. So um, in Brazil, a bank called Itau, um, they spent um, a lot of money last year and invested, invested a lot of resources in looking across the whole business in terms of how could they apply the technology. It landed into sort of three buckets. One of them was customer experience, so similar to the um, you know, um, contact center assistance, um, things like helping with uh, automation of um, loan applications. Um, thirdly was um, developer productivity. So similar to what uh, you were saying about Telstra in terms of you know, 30 40% developer productivity improvement there. So they, they had a, a broad scale of different experiments. Now they're starting to see where they double down on, and it's generally those, those buckets that they're investing in. Um, the second one was, was Rocket Home Loans. I'm pretty sure any retail bank here would have heard of Rocket uh, over in the US. They did a similar thing, but focused on the home loan application process. So taking extracts from documents customers put in or that they already had information about and, and taking the application time down to something minuscule. So they're now performing, I think it's two and a half times the, the rate of home loan applications than the rest of the US. So that's in speed, so two and a half times faster than the average home loan application rate. So again, massive success for them. Um, I think on a local front, we're working with a number of you in this room. Um, I think probably the most interesting stories of those were, we talked about financial hardship earlier today, um, identifying those customers that maybe are going through financial hardship and helping process those um, calls for help more effectively as well. So some of those really customer changing stories there are gonna be coming through very, very soon. So there's a lot of the, the retail banks here particularly have set targets you know, for you know, third quarter this year, fourth quarter. You'll start to see those things come out. So I think it's really impressive to see how quickly the Australian financial services industry has adopted to that technology. Amazing. Um, so you know, we are here talking about AI readiness and, and one of the big questions is are we ready and how do we make sure that we're ready? We, um, we have to think about our customers and we've heard a lot from our regulators today there are, we, are we, we operate in a highly regulated environment and we have high expectations of our customers around you know, high quality customer service, making sure they're looked after, making sure that they, they're kept safe. Um, how, do we, how do we make sure that as we're implementing this technology that we've put the right safeguards in place and um, that we are ready to utilise them in you know, production scale applications? And Fig, I'll, I'll start with you again from a client services perspective. What are you seeing in the industry? Yeah, let me start with what we are seeing uh, globally because currently from a regulatory point of view, there are actually not many reg regulators who have a uh, data and AI regulation. However, our neighbours in Singapore, they, uh, the Mon Monetary Authority for Singapore, which is basically the central bank and the financial regulator, they recognise the benefits of AI. And they also have identified that AI comes with certain risks. So just think about um, the unintended consequences um, AI can cause, right? And it's not about the jug that you, um, that uh, funny example, it could be, it is uh, about people's um, decisions uh, and their financials. Let me give you one example. Um, it, it could be that through AI, um, certain people of a certain gender, ethnicity, postcode, would not get their lending application approved. Or in the insurance uh, in a world, that um, insurance um, payments based on a postcode where somebody is living is higher even though the claims don't uh, support those data for some reason that comes up. So the, um, the regulator and the central bank in Singapore, they actually have um, have identified that and um, understood that they need some key principles and all FSIs in, uh, in Singapore have to apply all solutions to those um, principles. The principles are pretty straightforward when you think about it. It is just evaluating everything you build against fairness, ethics, accountability and trans uh, transparency. So, if, if you look at that and look, look at it, what we are in Australia have to do, it is basically not just a compliance and regulatory issue, but also to understand as a bank or any other company that with all the benefits AI 
brings, you also have the responsibility. But if you have responsible AI and implement all your AI solutions with responsible AI, you can actually enhance your brand, uh, um, brand awareness and also the brand equity. Um, sorry for that. Um, obviously, if you, if you fail to do that, it may have an impact. The good thing is we are highly regulated, uh, um, and all banks have their risk um, uh, frameworks already uh, in place, and they will need to be enhanced with LLM and uh, Gen AI, which uh, makes it actually um, easier for us. Great. Um, and just staying in the same lane, we obviously at NAB, we had to do a, or we have done a, a pretty rigorous view of our total um, risk landscape. And it's been good because we had to look at, at all of our existing material risks and make sure that under that posture, we are in a position where we feel that we can control this technology. But there are policy and procedure changes that we need to make to ensure that our people are able to actively engage with those changes, understand what they're doing, understanding what we're implementing, and really continue to have that customer front of mind. So, Tracy and Fegan, I'm going to ask you this question, and Paul Warren can sit over there in his technology provider land. Um, at your organisations, do you think regulators, regulation are keeping up with the changes in AI, and how are you thinking about that internally? And maybe Tracy will start with you. Yeah, I might share a story about how we're thinking about it internally. So Telstra have always really striven, strove, I should have thought about that word <laughs> before I tried to use it. Strive. <laughs> we really always aimed to be a leader in responsible AI. We believe that we want to and intend to go way above and beyond our customer or regulate our expectations. Back in 2021, we were one of the first to sign up to the Australian AI ethics principles. And more recently, I've been in this role for sort of eight months now, and we're just about finished our first project to refresh how we manage and govern AI risk. So the policies and the processes and measures behind them all made sense a couple of years ago, but because the technology is moving so quickly and customer, stakeholder, citizen expectations keep changing so quickly, we're in the middle of a huge overhaul. So just to bring that to life, you might have heard before Christmas, we had a campaign for free calls to Santa. So all of the families could take their children, young or old, to the payphones, and you could ring Santa. Um, spoiler alert, it wasn't really Santa. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Our Santa was generated by AI. And before we launched that campaign, we obviously had a huge process to work through the potential risks and how we'd manage them. So through that process, two things really um, forced us to look at our approach and our policies and our training. So one was safety. We know the examples earlier of hallucinations. We know generative AI has new kinds of failure modes, so we had to be very confident that we had the right guardrails in place so that AI Santa couldn't go wrong. Incredibly high risk situation with people's children. The second issue that that raised was transparency. So we mentioned that the, uh, Telstra has been signed up to the Australian AI regulations since the beginning. And one of those, not regulations, ethics principles. And one of those ethics principles is around transparency. And we had the best debates internally about should we be transparent for every call to tell every child, every parent, every family member, this isn't really Santa, this is AI. Or was it better to keep the magic of Christmas alive? So having these real world debates helps us learn how these things work in reality and take that back and improve our training and our processes and our thinking. And just last week, we announced that Telstra were invited to join the UNESCO Business Council for Responsible AI, so to promote UNESCO's Responsible AI agenda, including things like AI literacy, and sustainability. So we're super proud to be part of that global opportunity to learn and contribute together. Amazing. 
And Fegan, how about yourself from an Accenture point of view? Yeah, look, um, from an Accenture point of view, um, AI trainings were even mandatory pre-chat GPT, if you're just taking that as a timeline. So um, all 740,000 employees, it doesn't matter if they're in technology and consulting or in, in the back office actually have to do their AI training. Um, furthermore, we have also a responsible AI journey, which um, has implemented and, and is enforcing our set of um, principles, which we've defined. So now we can't say everybody takes those principles and applies them to themselves. Every organization has to define their own principles and has to put their governance structure and governance strategy on that. Uh, a really important um, topic on top of that is probably talent strategy. So when we are talking around uh, talking about AI and responsible AI and understanding with all these benefits that you can just click on uh, on a button and get all the information, don't have to do the research yourself, just to understand how do you apply critical thinking and know the two litre jug is, can't have the three litres in them, right? So that is also uh, part of responsible AI, which uh, companies have to look at and train their employees in. Excellent. And now looking to the future, you know, we've had this year lots of promise, but we're seeing across the industry, a lot of people are just still in pilot, POC, test and learn mode. Warren, starting with you, uh, where do we think, um, what do we think the pathways and uh, barriers are to move beyond this state, this pilot experiment state? and get to scale utilisation across organisations. Cool, thanks Jess. So there's kind of three areas we're seeing as sort of blockers for sort of scale adoptions. So the first of all is skills. Um, so I think you know, there's, there's a number of um, uh, ever-changing components to think about. Um, what we're seeing is that companies don't necessarily have the scale of skills in their organisations. So again, if you've got a, a mature organisation that's kind of got a big um, resource pool of data scientists and data engineers, that's great, but you still need the people at the other end to go, how do we use the technology? How do we understand what's possible and what's not possible? So I think one of the biggest, um, the biggest challenges is certain um, people think that Jenny and I can solve every problem. It's, it's not the case. It's going to solve certain things really, really well. Other things, just there's other technology that can do that for you or other processes and people that can do it. So for, for us, it's, you know, it's the understanding of going, how do you make sure that people have access to the, te to the technology, they can play with it, some sort of sandpit environments or some safe way they can go and upload their sensitive documents and run queries on them and things or whatever it might be, but having that space to play but then also giving them the skills to actually understand what to do with it. So that's one of them. The second one is we're seeing challenges around sort of data. Um, a, is it in the cloud, is it accessible or is it stored over here in a format that you can't use? So a lot of companies that have spent a lot of time and energy sort of getting the data warehouses together and everything sort of curated in a nice way go, actually, this doesn't work for us. Um, I'm sure you're seeing that as well. Um, in that you've, you've got to look at the permissions around it as well. So some of this data is fairly sensitive. You don't want to have an internal chatbot where you can plug in and go, what's the salary of the, you know, X, Y, Z, what's the performance reviews, this kind of thing. So we're, we're seeing that customers going, this is great. It's actually exposing some of the fragility of what we've got from a data governance point of view. So they're spending some time to, to put that foundation in place. Um, just to make sure that things aren't going to go wayward. Um, and then the third one is the, the actual the broader platform itself. So um, a lot of you have, have got very mature cloud platforms. You've got automation. You've got all these great guardrails in place. You can run your extreme inherent risk workloads in the cloud. That's great. Gen AI is slightly different. You need different controls in place. You need different um, supporting mechanisms. You need different policies and processes and everything else in there building those and spending some time to actually make sure you can have something robust that you can then drop in a number of use cases and just run really quickly. So those are the kind of three things we're seeing. Amazing. And Tracy, what about in Telstra? Um, I might try and distill a lot of lessons in uh, three things. So um, start by anchoring to a real problem. If you start with something that feels um, optional, then when times get tough, you'll move on. Mm -hmm. So your pilot will... So start by anchoring to something real that's worth solving. Second thing we learned is to measure. This is... Treat it like an experiment, treat it like science. If you don't know what you're trying to move and you don't know your baseline, how will you know if you're making a difference? Start measuring something and then keep measuring the same thing, using the same method. And finally, 
don't be afraid to stop. If your thing isn't working, isn't moving in the right direction, isn't moving quickly enough, that scarce team of skilled people or time or dollars spent on cloud providers could be better spent somewhere else. So don't get too dug in to any idea. Start with a meaningful problem space, measure, and change track if it's not working. Yeah, amazing. I think I agree with everything everyone said. And I, from a NAB perspective and on the, the, the three things theme, I love that comment around find a real problem. And that's sort of how we've set ourselves up at NAB is we don't want this to be the QR code waiting for its pandemic to have a usage and now it's everywhere. Um, this is a technology that can help with real customer problems. But there's three sort of things we're seeing in that operational space. One is just the change in behaviour that we need for our people. So a lot of these processes have moved from a use your own thinking to a review type mode. So rather than creating a document, you need to review it and make sure it's right. That human in the loop piece. How do we shift our organisation towards that? The, the second is just the, the concerns, I guess, around the technology readiness to operate at scale, both from a cost, compute, and just general kind of SLA, SLA expectation perspective. <laughs> And then finally, it's just for us, some of our most interesting use cases, they're in our really highly regulated spaces. So we're, we're talking to our teams in financial crimes and there are a lot of steps in there that are, write a summary, write a summary, which is what this technology is great at. But those processes cannot be wrong. And so how do we get our regulators and our risk partners to help determine that implementation of these technologies meet the expectations that we need to meet to operate. And I think what's going to be really interesting over the next 12 months is as we start moving to scale with some of these use cases, how we really dive into some of those big problems from an operational readiness perspective. So that'll be the next chapter as we continue to partner with everyone here on actually getting things built and delivered. So little speed round. Um, Warren, you mentioned skills. What are the um, top two skills that you each think we need in our organisations to support the business moving forward? So there's, there's, there's two things. I think um, Adam um, you know, ran that interesting activity at the beginning of this, this panel around who's used it, who uses it regularly. I think there's a stat I've seen quite consistently, which is I think it's 10% of knowledge workers in the world have actually used Gen AI. 2% use it on a semi-regular basis, i.e. once a week or once a month. So I think until you, know, you see that broad scale sort of general use, the, the prompting, asking questions, that's the basic skill itself of going, just use it, to get the experience of going out there and actually trying it out. Um, I was talking to um, one of our leaders in Amazon locally a few weeks ago, and, and she used the phrase of, it's, it's those that can ask the best question that are going to win in this race. Um, and again, if you think about the amount of possibilities that you can do with this technology, it's, it's, and the, the amount of compute that you use to maybe ask some complex questions, asking the right question. And I think that translates into sort of prompt engineering. So how good are the questions you're asking? What are those things you're putting around it to go? Are you getting the right context in place? Are you pulling in the right data? Um, again, there's certain examples I've seen where people are pulling in every single piece of data. They're looking at their entire warehouse and the internet and Bloomberg and everything else. And you're like, this is too much. It's too much information. It's actually confusing the system. So make the question simple. Make it very clear. Give it the context. Give it the information it needs and just the information it needs. And it's having that insight. So it's not a technology problem or a skill. It's simply going, what is the problem you're trying to solve here? Great. Anything to add? Um, I might tackle this in two ways. So the absolute key skill building on what Warren just said is curiosity. So the people who understand the problems, the people who live the problems day to day are the ones who are going to lead the solving of those problems. So having people given the time, the incentives, the ability, the safe tools to go and be curious and learn. The second thing in terms of skills that we've learned is the, the continuing importance of science and engineering. So we have a whole bunch of fantastic data scientists, data engineers, in the new paradigm where we can access other people's models, we don't have to build models in some cases, we can access them via APIs. That doesn't mean that we don't need our scientists. So one of the things we've learned is the changing role of data scientists to measure the effectiveness. And because we know that whether we're using language models for search or summarization, 
we need some really um, effective and really robust and repeatable ways to measure their effectiveness. Amazing. Anything to add from a skills perspective? I think no. uh, the, from a skills perspective uh, covered and um, the talent strategy is really important, which I mentioned just earlier. Totally agree. Yeah. And final question, we might have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, just your quick prediction for the next 12 months. Fegan, I'll start with you. All right, quick prediction. Um, I don't, I don't want to talk about more use cases because as we heard, Gen AI is not the answer for all your problems. But what is really important and the prediction for the next 12 months from my point of view is that we will focus on overall holistic strategies to understand which use cases are actually the ones we should prioritize, scale them up, deliver value, and then uh, move to, um, to the next stage. Um, I predict we're all gonna see the classic hype cycle play out. We're at the peak of expectations. No technology is as good as these expectations make it out to be. And the companies and the organizations who are really successful in 12 months time will be the ones who anchored to real problems that are worth solving and who were the best at learning and measuring and scaling and growing. Lauren. Cool, two things then. So first of all, um, I think consumer expectations are gonna be that this is the new norm. This is gonna be the expectation that your customer service is gonna have this as a default capability. So I think before the thing around, you know, sort of the financial wellbeing help or the, the support there of having humans behind it, people are gonna go, it's okay to have an AI there. If it's giving me a better experience, you know, 24 seven, um, so I'm gonna want that. It's interesting, you know, you're gonna have it on your phone um, within the next few months as well. So that proliferation of people using it every single day is gonna mean that people are used to it the whole time. So banks, insurers are gonna be expected to have it. So I think that's the first one. The second one is the cost. Um, it's like Moore's law on steroids. This stuff's getting cheaper and faster and better all the time. So even last week, I was saying to my colleagues here before, I did my research for this, this morning because I get my emails through going, here's a new model, here's a new technology that's coming out. It's changing every single day. So I think you're gonna find that what might be cost prohibitive today in a month's time won't be the case. Okay. I think we just have a couple of minutes for some any questions from the, the floor. Absolutely, we've got two audience mics out there. If anyone wants to ask a question, throw your hands in the air right now. Grab the attention of audience mics and we'll take a couple of questions. Back of the room there, what would you like to ask? Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'd like to understand how the panel's gone about thinking about data protection and data privacy. Uh, I mean, where, for instance, China is quite restrictive about things like training data. Great, Tracy, do you want to start with that one? Um, yeah, one of the first things Telstra did was to negotiate with Microsoft to have an incredibly protected instance of Copilot. So before we opened it up to all of our colleagues, um, tens of thousands of Telstra colleagues, the first thing we did was to think about the sensitive customer and um, employee and the sensitive information. So that was the first step we did. Um, data protection continues to be one of the critical steps of everything we do as we design more solutions. Yeah. And similar at NAB, we're very much focused on making sure we're following pretty standard SDLC procedures. We don't have the capability broadly across the organisation for that reason. We want to make sure we're experimenting in a controlled way and we're using tools that have the right protections in place to help colleagues with their more generalised productivity. As opposed to one of the big phone companies where some of the, uh, they, were, they had a new launch of a phone coming up, I won't name the brand, and the, uh, the, the coders put a chunk of code into GPT to see if they could improve upon the brand. And for a while there, there was a window open where if rivals had gone, I'm trying to look to do this with a phone, you know, what sort of coding should I use? They would have been told, well, the next Samsung or Nokia or whatever uses exactly this. And these people had released the code wide onto the net, not really reason they'd done it. Yes, what would you like to ask? Um, as we talk about scaling the use of AI, how are you thinking about managing the environmental impacts and kind of the minimising the environmental footprint of using it? Ooh. Great question. Fegan, do you want to take that from a Accenture point of view? Sure. Um, what you're seeing? Yeah, what we're seeing. Um, I think it, it's, it's a great question. Uh, from an environmental impact, obviously, um, you, you can look at it from uh, different angles, right? So if you, um, if you 
look at the processes, make them more efficient, automate them, you're actually saving assets and data and electricity, etc. And then also from our um, employee experience, but also from the impact uh, of work hours um, the employee is putting into that process, if you, you're reducing them, you can use those assets like working hours to do, uh, to do quite other things or quite more uh, valuable items which will then also impact the environment. And I think, you know, we had the sustainability conversation earlier. Mm. It is a big factor at a more macro level. Telstra, I'm sure mm. you have a very similar position to us at NAB that needs to be considered as we scale. I read one stat. If every, one of the, if every Google search in the world was currently being done on a GPT, you'd need a power supply the size of the country of Ireland just to run all the word servers in the moment. In the moment. They are absolutely voracious energy beasts. And what an energy beast panel we had. Jessica, thank you so much for convening Fegan, Tracey and Warren. Give them a round of applause.